Um, okay, uh, I think we're no fair to start, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so, hey everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Kavanagh. Uh, I'm the manager in the OECC. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I was a bit early, but uh, the earlier the better. It won't take too long, maybe an hour at uh, most. You know, this is this is it won't be too much in this. Most a lot of you might um, a lot of you might know most of it. You might not know some of it. It might be beneficial for you in some way. You know. Um, just to give you some context uh, around the OECC. Um, so um, as I said, I'm the manager. Uh, the main function of us is that we act as the middleman between the operator and fixed access operations, okay, so FAO, for both false um, repairs and delivery. Um, we're a very small team, but we're in the middle of wholesale, um, and we handle a very large amount of queries, so this training has been sort of tailored so you, so, uh, to show you what we can do or what we do and help you identify when to come to us for assistance and, and things like that using the escalation matrix. Um, and placing sort of basic orders, finding out how to find things out about the customer, things like that before coming to us. So, so to put in perspective, you know, we process or see every single order that goes into into the access network for delivery. You know, thousands of orders a month, rain, sun, or snow. So that and us managing that screen, every single fault that that every one of our 40 plus operators log on the UG is a big operation for a small team, you know. And um, our operation is broken into four or five smaller teams who all have their own roles in, as teams, as individuals, and then as a the wider group roles as well that we have, that we're involved with with different different uh, market units and different parts of the organization and downstream and FAO and, and things like that. <laughs> so <clears throat> just getting into the training. And um, please, uh, can I ask you if you turn off your mic and your webcam because this is being recorded and um, there'll be time at the end for questions. Um, I'd like you to ask questions if you have them um, on anything that I'm covering for the next hour or so. All right. So uh, you can also type your questions in the text box in the bottom right. Or if you're more comfortable afterwards, you can email me the questions or anything like that um, and we'll answer them for you if, if you're more comfortable. Uh, so following on from that session where we gave a, a broad detail on, on a lot of subjects, um, this is a this is a tighter deck about the topics that you re requested more information on. So for those of you who are on yesterday's false call, this is a, a lot less technical and is a, a bit more a bit more of a how-to guide based on orders rather than rather than assurance and reading false information and things like that. So uh, the recording will be going onto our YouTube channel afterwards. So I might break it into two videos, depending on depending on how long it is. Um, it will just be a good way for you to refer back to if you ever need to, or if you're training new you know, agents and things like that, all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're also planning on on uploading lots and lots of small how-to videos. This is just just so you know how to use AI, how to place orders, how to how to search for things in the UG, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it'll be handy for you if you ever if you ever need to use it. You might not need to use it, hopefully not, but if you do, uh, it will be there. So just about uh, what we'll be covering. Um, so we'll be going over the structure of the OECC. OECC, I've said that. Uh, but we'll also be touching our escalation matrix. So this will give you an idea of who to contact, uh, when to contact them, and and things like that, and what type of issues these people do on the escalation matrix. Um, we also look at how AI works because we've got a lot of questions about uh, different ways to find their codes and, and things like that, find their keys, that sort of situation in in the UG GUI. Um, it will be it will be fairly basic, but it will give you screenshots of everything you need to know uh, to go back and search uh, AI and search for addresses, and that will lead into lead into part two, which will be which will be prequel. Um, that's you know we find out how to place a prequel, how to read the results, how to request prequel updates from us, um, if one is needed, things like that. Um, and we'll also be touching on MBI as well uh, for those of you who resell MBI um, from from Opener as an RSP. Um, we will then look at the new tenant process, uh, what it is. If we got a, we got a lot of we get a lot of questions about this. Um, so what it is, how to use it, what's the email address, that sort of stuff. We actually covered it and we we covered the new tenant process for operators. 
Um, and we also cover credit management and we touch on that as well. It's a similar, very similar process to new tenant to, to new tenant, but it's a bit tighter. And there's different provisos around it. So you have to have different you have to be the account has to be in a specific state before you can request a credit management request. I'll touch on that at the end. Those two sections four and five are a bit text heavy. Um it's the only way to do it, but it'll be good to refer back to it again. Uh, so in sections one, two, and three are more are more visual guides just to just to just to have a look at so you can use it as you go. And um, so starting on the uh, matrix and the escalation structure, or the, the OECC structure and the escalation matrix, all right. So as you can see uh, on the chart there, um, on the manager, there are a few different teams in TLs who report into me. Um, it's important to know that we do not handle non-standard orders, okay? So um, there's two different types of orders and faults, non-standard and standard. So standard being, you know, it goes out, happy days, goes out straight for delivery, no issues. Non-standard being things like direct buried leads, you know, blockages, works orders, trees on public property, all that sort of stuff, you know, that's all handled by your customer success manager or your service fulfillment manager. Um, so starting from the left-hand side there, <clears throat> first point of contact is the OECC email address and the phone number, um, which I'm sure you would all know. Yeah. Um, so uh, the email team are managed by Mark Bulger on the right-hand side there. Email queries are usually used for like of pre-call updates, request for minor plant alterations, notifying us of how the, of the owner of a CLI. So say, for example, <clears throat> we get married to, to Paula there and she changes her surname to Kavanaugh, but she wants to keep her phone number and you place a CN, but we reject it because the surname is different. You notify us through email um, of the surname change and then we place a CN again and we process it. So all that sort of stuff where we need written confirmation of, that's what the email team is for. Um, it can also be used for requesting updates on orders and things like that as well. So it, it's no problem if you want to come to the email team for order updates or ring in. It, it, that's an option for both. It shouldn't be used for the likes of requesting us to add notes into faults, updating air codes on faults, etc. things like that, because they're much more time sensitive, all right? So when we have a fault out in the field, it's, it's the best practice is to give us the information as fast as possible because there could be a technician on route or on site or trying to find a house or trying to find whatever he needs to find. And, and we, have <clears throat> we have the wrong information for the customer. They're not reachable or the air code's wrong on the fault or, or whatever the situation is. So we need to get them out as fast as possible. And that's where the, that's where the call team come in, all right? So they're managed by Mark Lynch. You should be calling into us for fault notes, as I said, reassigning faults, uh, confirming error keys. So we don't get that much anymore, but I just thought I'd mention it because if, if you're not sure about an error key, you know, some so it could be one and one A, for example, in a housing estate, and you're not sure which one to pick. If you ring us, if you ring us with an error key, we can confirm if it's the if it's the, the right error key for the premises or not on the phone to you. And um, we don't see it too much anymore, but it is something that used to be done a lot. It might stop you having to place an LE, save an order. You know, it might be faster to pick up the phone and ring. Just, just an option. Um, things like that. All right. So the false, that's what the false team is for. It shouldn't be used for pre-call requests. Uh, confirming information needed for some order types. Again, like the CN that I used as an example, we need written requests for some things. Um, requests for updates on failed EEs can be handled on calls all right so if for example you're ringing and looking for an update on a failed EE now not an FT okay so the difference between an FT and an FA uh, for those of you who weren't on the call yesterday an FP and an FA you can see the updates on UG you can reschedule them all this sort of lovely stuff but for a net for a failed EE um, where we've issued on behalf of the operator um, you can't get updates so you need to ring us for the updates or ask us to reassign it ask us to send it back out if that is the case and that needs to be done, we'll create a case and let you know when that's out in the field. <clears throat> um, call team are also the lads who actually screen all your faults. So any faults that you're ringing about, um, the chances are they've seen it already. So if you're querying a reject, querying what the notes mean, we would have put them notes on more often than not if it's, if it, if it's referred back as on and four, okay? Um, whether it's referred back as on and four or, or zero, zero, one or whatever the referral code is, um my lads are fairly skilled so they will help you so if you aren't sure about the notes or aren't sure what we're looking for pick up the phone give them a buzz and they will uh help you out with that as well 
you should never be calling the OECC about a fault that has an active parent fault on a dashboard, all right? That's always, always refer to a dashboard about that. So say, for example, there's a, a 200 pair damage, you know, from a, a tree that came down or whatever the situation is, um, that's, that goes up on a dashboard generally. And it will have a number range there. We have contacts in our operators who ask for the number ranges we give them. And we also supply the number ranges on the dashboard too. Um, all updates for non for, for for bigger faults like that will be available on the dashboard. And if it's a massive outage, we send out updates from the open air service updates email. Uh, it just so a few of us in wholesale have access to that, and we send out updates if it's if it's a big concern, you know, with the P zero like well, like last week for example, or if there's if there's massive issues in one part of one part of the country or one type of service. Um, there's also two other teams in the OECC that don't get much of a mention on these graphs and charts and stuff ever. But they are there, and they're a big part of it. They're GMP and manual tasks, all right? So they're managed by Alan McGowan there in the bottom right. <clears throat> the manual task team handles, as I said earlier on, every single wholesale order that goes out to the field, all right? So every single order that's placed on the UG that falls out from manual processing. So this could be anything. It could be fixing a line. It could be it could be updating a bit of this inventory system, whatever the situation is. But it could also be, and regularly, it, you know, the reordering of a, of, a, of one thousand or five thousand lines of the PRA and, and things like that, very you know complicated, complex orders, and they handle actually around twenty thousand of these orders every single month. So, um, it's a lot, and uh, they start to sit in the background and keep the place ticking over. Well, so any any updates, any email cases, sorry, if you if your orders are recorded, for example, in your email, the OECC, the chances are the email team have asked the manual task team to have a look at that, um. And they will get it through the line, over the line for you. Uh, and we also have uh, the GMP lads. Um, they manage all the port and also network. So again, managed by Alan. Uh, GMP means geographic number porting, and a lot of numbers of you can you can imagine. So if I, uh, for example, if I want to leave and go to Virgin and take my number with me, I'm entitled to it, like I am with any number. We port them numbers numbers in and off the Aircom network as well for operators all the time, hundreds and hundreds of those a week, and um, that's what they do. And lastly, we handle uh, Ethernet and NGN faults as well. So core network faults, this is option two down the bottom there in, 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 on the IVR. Uh, core transmission faults, interconnects, voice traffic, all that sort of stuff, we handle all of those as well. So if there's, if there's, if there's issues or um, any major customer circuits that are core or interconnect circuits, we handle them as well and we deal with the operator. And um, depending on the operator you are on this call, you might or might not be dealing with them. So just moving on, uh, this is the escalation matrix, sorry. So as I said, OECC, always first point of contact, level one, uh, which will be uh, Alan and Mark. Depending on what the issue is, as I said previously, Alan deals with the manual task, the GMP, that sort of stuff. Mark deals with the, deals with the, um, deals with the fault and the calls team and all that sort of, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you go to them, all right. If your phone numbers are there, they're always reachable. You can get them. They're really, really helpful. They're always there to help. They rather if you ring them than come in with them. Or they rather if you ring you and do rather if you ring and do something right rather than try something and do it wrong if you're not sure. You know, so the phone's always there. We're not going to buy. Um, and again, Mark Holder is the uh, escalation manager, but he also handles handles email teams for any updates and cases that you're not getting or whatever. Um, that's uh. That's uh, you go to him, all right, and he also handles level two escalations for me, and um, so that's to do with quality and quality issues, you know, like a builder, a builder smashed brick on a on a, on a delivery, things like that. And then sensitive issues, you know, so for example, say things that you don't, you're not really comfortable with ringing in or emailing in about, um, you come you come to level two escalations because, um, there's some things obviously that you can't say over the phone. I don't, that you don't want to say over the phone, whether it's personal information, whether it's something sensitive about somebody, or whether it's an actual bigger issue, you know, like it doesn't have to do with the install, and it has to do with the, the, the tone of the voice of the technician, for example, all that sort of stuff that comes in through level two escalations. Um, and obviously, always are also coming through level two escalations is your rise and safe. So, any updates um, for rise and safe? Uh, that you don't get after, you know, if they're not do, if rise isn't done after a day and if safe isn't done after two days, come into level two um, and we update you there, all right? And level three is myself. Um, so bigger outages, you know, I deal with bigger outages, engagement, I engage with the SMC, NMC for those transmission files I said earlier on. Um, 
and I jump into like the war room and things like that and, and conference bridges when there's when there's faults on, on operator networks or on our networks. But again, uh people the phone ring me. I'm always there. Most of you know me anyway. Uh I'm always available. Well, for any reason that was the um, and a level four is your CSM uh, or SSM, depend on the operator. I left that blank because obviously depend on the amount, with the amount of operators on this call here, you, you have a different CSM or, or, or SSM. So, so you know, things like non-standard orders, as I said, non-standard faults, uh, UG shared access, all that sort of stuff. Um, that's your, your, your CSM. Or if you haven't got either of those, so if you're, and you're looking for, say, for example, UG shared, your account manager covers that array. Um, and then Paola at level four and Stuart at level five, you might never need to contact them. Hopefully not. But um, Paola is the is the service team manager, so she is over the customer success managers. Um, and and so so, um, she's their team manager. And then Stuart is Paola and, and my manager, so it means Paola reporting to Stuart. And um, moving on. Um, so AI. Um, I hope you can hear my doorbell ringing. Sorry. AI, <laughs> what is it? So AI is a digest interface tool which is available in the UG GUI. They can be used for finding an RT, finding an air code, finding a serving exchange. Now you might or might not ever need to use that, but it's handy to have if you want it. Um, and it's also used for, it can be used for finding an active CLI or CRN address belonging to an operator. So say for example, um, I'm in operator A and I log on to AI and I'm trying an address and I want to see what's going on at the address. I can actually see in AI web the, the phone number that belongs to that, to that, to that address. I'm just going to show you now in more detail. It's pretty straightforward stuff, but um, so how to find an ARD uh, using AI? All right, this is when you know the air code. It's very simple. It's really hard to see. Actually, I thought I made that clearer. But uh, uh, so how to, so all you do is you go to information orders on the UG, and then click on address search, and hopefully, hopefully that's clear for you. Uh, and then and then all you do is. Once you're in, you put popped up, this window gets popped up, you present, you're presented with it, and it's very straightforward, as you expect, in the air code field, you, you throw in the air code there. And um, there has to be a space in it. Um, and likewise, when you're doing QBs, you need to include the space, all right? It's just recommended. Um, and then our system's take them out in the background and I put them back in, but it's recommended to use the space. So once you throw the air code in anyway, hit search at uh, the top left corner there, and you'll be given, you, you, this window here on the left hand side will pop up. And um, you can see important bits of information on this. So you can see here the address of the maintaining the exchange area. So that's, that's BRN. So that stands BRN is by Brigham Exchange. And you can see that also again on the bottom. You can see the LI that this customer is on. You know, you can, in the top right corner there, it's just where I was saying, so if I had that line, see where it says name and telephone number and the action date, things like that, it would be visible to you. So if, for example, I'm a Vodafone and I log in and this is a Vodafone customer, I just suggest I'll be able to see that information there. Um, the rest of the stuff you don't need to worry about. Uh, it's, it's, it's just soft, all tone, different bits of directory information. The main thing you're looking for, obviously, is the R key. So just tap on return there on the right, on the left hand side. Um, and you'll be given the R key, it'll pop out there on the, on the right there, you'll be given that. So that's grand. It's all handy dandy when you have the when you have the air code or the customer knows the air code. What if it's what if you don't know the air code? It's a little, it's a little bit messier, and I actually prefer using it this way anyway, um, because it's much easier. You can get a, a much more detailed information for the for the street and things like that. Um, so again, once you're inside inside AI, um, you present it with this window here. Um, you simply just throw the 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 long address in down the bottom there. Just some, before I move on, I didn't put it in the slides, but if you have telephone number, uh, if you know the telephone number, you can search it as well if you know it and in, in the middle section there. Uh, it's hit or miss, to be honest with you, I, would, I don't recommend using it. The address is always better, you know, and if you actually know this customer is here and or they're, they were there or whatever, because you can search for previous or existing, uh, existing phone numbers. Anyway, the long address there. Uh, and you can see there the address. We'll just go back a tiny bit. Um, you can see that I didn't see it's one St. George's Square, uh, Babrigan. All right, but I left out one on purpose on this on this on this deck because you know what if the customer doesn't you know what if it's you know the hook or you know the cottage, Babrigan. You don't know it could be anywhere in Babrigan, you know. So so you can actually widen your search, and I recommend that you widen your search. So in this case. For this example, I left out the number one. So obviously, you you want to see what's in St George's Square in Dublin. So you can do that, 
and you also don't actually have to use Dublin either. Um, you can use the best way to describe it is if a car reg plate. So you can use D, you could use WD for Waterford, you could use you know LK for Limerick, whatever it is, CK for Cork, C for Cork, you can use as well. And depending on where you are, it just it might not make a much of a difference, but there's all sorts of short codes as well. If you want afterwards, I can send you those list of list of uh, short codes. And also there's a little cheat sheet. You can do things like search and use an ampersand to get a wider view and things like that. I'll, I'll explain that to you. I have, I have a separate cheat sheet that I can send on about that too. Um, anyway, sorry. So yeah, once you type in the address and hit search, instead of being presented immediately with the with the window for the address, you're given the street. Um, you're given the street, or if they, if they can find it. All right. So again, if they can't find it, maybe go back and take out take it, try it again, but take out ST because it could be in the system as S A I N T. You know, things like that. You will find it. Everything is there. Every street is there. So please do search. Um. So again, so anyway, here, so we got we got the Saint George Square anyway, Bob Brigham. Uh, and you can see there the list of premises, the air codes, uh, things like that. And you can see there, you know, the line numbers, you know, active, yes or no, that sort of stuff. Um, but we're uh, we're looking for uh, number one, obviously, so you can see it there anyway on the screen, right? So, um, so we found number one. Uh, all you do is, is double click it. Um, you can use the scroll bar on the right hand side, uh, and then you can see where the left hand on the, the, the left hand green thing is there that you can uh, you can fill in the address. But if, if for example you got to the end of that page, there's a button up the top that says more, and um, so say there's 500 numbers on it, 500 premises on the street, just hit more and more and more, you know, until you get to roughly where the number is that you want to go. It's in numerical order, and um, so you should find it fairly quickly. Uh, yes, again, double click it, you get back into the same screen you were in before, and happy day to sound. You found the R key there. So there are the two most common ways of finding R keys. There is an issue sometimes of finding R keys uh, with your code. Uh, if you can find the R key with your code, please do use the long address if you can. It will save you placing an LE, as I can say here. So, so in summary, so an R key, the best way to describe what an R key is, it's like a DNA for, for our premises already. It has, it, has, it has a lot of indexation tied to it. It has bits and pieces of, of information tied to it that, that network that let the inventory network and network guys know what can be done and what lets us know what they can pre-qual for, all that sort of stuff. It's very important. And um, obviously our keys are up before air codes, so we're moving to air codes now, but that's what it was. So back in the day when there was no such thing as air codes, every premises has an air key, simple as that. They're all unique, like, you know, it, the lines in your hand, you know. Uh, if an air, so that's, if an air code isn't known, uh, this is the easiest and quickest way to return an ARD without the need for an LE. All right, it, it does save you time. LEs can go to invalidations, they can go to recorders, they don't always go complete, things like that. Um, and you can find the other information as well, as I said, like the CRN, the CLI, and uh, the exchange information.